Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Office of Court Administration. My name is Neetu Gill and I will be today's moderator. I am the project coordinator here in the Research and Court Services Division at the Office of Court Administration. The Research and Court Services Division moderates a webinar each month and today's topic is Understanding Court Management. Prior to beginning the presentation, I would like to just address a few housekeeping details. Please mute your microphone. If you do have a question, please use the chat box and I'll monitor it throughout the webinar. If there is a technical question, we will address that immediately. So if you cannot hear, if you cannot see the slides, please let me know and we'll make sure we fix that right away. And if there is a question pertaining to the presentation, we will address those at the end of the webinar. Today's speaker is Ms. Aurora Zamora. Ms. Aurora Zamora is employed with the Office of Court Administration as a court services consultant. As a consultant, she offers technical assistance to courts in court management, case management, I'm sorry, excuse me, case management and processes, and she also provides training to court personnel and court clerks. Without further ado, let's welcome Ms. Aurora Zamora. Hello there. How are you all doing? Before we start on understanding court management, we're going to take a poll to um, identify who our audience is today. So Nitu will take us to a poll and uh, give you some time to respond. I forgot to say that I will be on. Sit up. Okay, you should be seeing your poll on your screen. Uh, take some time to fill that up and or respond to it, and then we will see what the results are. We'll give it about 10 more seconds, Aurora. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And... All right, Aurora, it looks like the poll um, responses were that 51% of our audience has five to 10 years experience, 28% has one to five, and 21% has less than one year. Okay, okay so uh, 51 of you are very knowledgeable about these topics, and I want to thank you for joining us. Um, if you see anything that I have misstated or you want to correct me, you know how to reach me because chances are I know you. Um, so I've been on camera now. I'm going to ask Nitu to take me off camera so it will not be distracting to you. So let's proceed. Regardless of how long you've been in your position, we hope this webinar serves as an introduction to your future continuing education through OCA. So let's talk about who you are. Read these uh, title descriptions and see if they match up with what you are doing or what you are being uh, called when attorneys and your judge refers to you. As you read these titles and compare them to that for which you are responsible, you might say, well, that's not all I do. Or you may say, they need to change my title. Your title and your responsibilities is between you and your judge or judges. In urban counties, court managers often function as court administrators and have all the responsibilities of such. In rural counties, court coordinators may function as a court manager or a court administrator, depending on how many counties your court has. So titles are used liberally and are often interchangeable. For the sake of consistency with the statutes, I will refer to your position as court coordinator throughout this presentation. Also, as you view this webinar and hopefully uh, what you have learned, maybe you can share it with your judge. And after you do that, you may want direction on the appropriate salary for your position. OCA recently sent out a salary survey. Hopefully you received it and responded to it. The survey closed yesterday. 
and the results are being analyzed and will be posted on our website um, sometime around February the 15th. I often tell court coordinators that you have the best and easiest job ever. This page has several resources that we're going to talk about throughout the webinar and several resource, resources that I recommend you keep close to you. In the Texas statutes, you have specific instructions on what is permitted, may, and what is mandated shall become familiar with identifying and searching the different areas of law whether it's criminal family civil or other when you go to the texas constitution and statutes search by the specific code and chapter or you can search by the text that you are looking for article 5 of the texas constitution also on that page addresses the judicial department in Texas. In the rules of judicial administration and the, rule, the Texas rules of civil procedure, you will learn about local rules that govern your court and administrative matters related to district and statutory courts. The Texas judicial uh, website allows you to see what the policy making body for the state of for the judiciary in the state is recommending to the legislature. In OCA, you have many resources in the form of guides, publications, charts, and studies. Our mission is just that, to provide resources and information for the efficient administration of the judicial branch of Texas. For example, when you go to our website, between the text of the web page and the Texas flag, you'll see a ribbon across the top. If you will go to the rules, rules and forms, you can find all the rules that apply to the judiciary and the courts. Become familiar with our website, and if you ever have a suggestion on improving it, let us know. We're always looking for input. Throughout the presentation, I will refer to these resources and further instructions on how to access the information we are discussing, okay? So let's talk about the court structure of Texas. This court structure is also available on the website. If you're listening to this web webinar, chances are you're employed with either a district court or a statutory county court or better known as county courts at law. You'll see the two arrows in red that are point, pointing to those courts. In the chart, you will notice that county courts at law are the appellate venue for justice of the peace courts, JPs, and municipal courts. If a party is not satisfied with a ruling from either of these courts, they will appeal their case to your court. In counties where there are one or more county courts at law, the constitutional court or the county judge may still hear some cases such as probate, mental health, or juvenile. In counties where there is no county court at law, then the county court presides over all misdemeanors and civil cases as described in this chart. Parties not satisfied with a ruling from both county courts at law and district courts will, appear, will appeal their cases to one of the 14 courts of appeal or to the court of criminal appeals for criminal cases. To those 21% that have been in your position less than one year, this is a really good way to learn about your family in court management across the state. I encourage you to spend a little time studying the chart and the role your court plays in the overall court structure of Texas. It's very gratifying to see the role your court has and therefore you have in the administration of justice. So let's talk about our other family, the administrative judicial regions. In this slide, you can find the administrative judicial region that applies to your county, therefore your court. 
each region has an administrative presiding judge or PJ that oversees the judicial matters of every district and every county court at law in those counties that are within his or her region. For example, when your judge has a conflict hearing a case or someone objects to him or her presiding over the case, your PJ will assign a visiting judge from within the region to preside over the case. Although all presiding judges are responsible for these assignments, some have a particular process they follow when you request a judge. Again, this map and the directory of all the presiding judges is on our website. Call your PJ and inquire if there is a form or a specific manner to request a judge. And again, refer to the rules of judicial administration for processes and statutes that cover the judiciary. Okay, so let's learn more about you. Two important things um, affect what you do. One is the government code in section 71, 74, 106, which require a court coordinator in a district or county court at law to complete 16 hours of continuing education every year. The Texas Code of Judicial Conduct requires that judicial staff abide by the same standards as judges, including but not limited to these three. Refrain from manifesting bias or prejudice in the performance of your duty. Abstain from public comment about a pending or impending proceeding which may come before the judge and be patient dignified and courteous to litigants, to jurors, to witnesses, yes, to lawyers and others. Read and become familiar with these canons or rules of the Texas Code of Judicial Conduct. Recognize that often you're the only one that these litigants have to talk to about their case. Be patient, kind, polite when speaking to members of the public parties in a case, and other court and county professionals. Learn something new every day. To reach your 16 hours of continuing education, attend conferences hosted by professional associations, your local legal bar, a college or university. In the resource slide, you will find the link to the Texas Center for the Judiciary. They host the professional development program every year in June. The curriculum is tailored especially for you. They are also responsible for reporting your hours. You can do this by going to their website, downloading the form and sending it in with your hours. If what you are attending, uh, the program you're attending is hosted by anybody other than the Texas Center. The Texas Center is also um, as most of you know, responsible for the training of your judge. So what does a court coordinator do? Well, there is probably a five page list of duties that come with your position. But if you were to categorize them all by some type of um, topic, it would be to manage, direct, supervise, coordinate, and plan the operations of the court and to assist the judge in making certain decisions, except those decisions required by law to be made by the judge. If you are not an attorney, you may provide procedural information to a person, but you may not offer legal advice. Self-represented litigants or pro se litigants need advice, direction, and knowledge about what will happen in their case. Refer them to self-help resources. On our website, at this link, you can find information that is not legal advice and does not take the place of talking to a lawyer. I can't remind you enough how important your position is. You are the cornerstone of the court. You will bring all of these administrative processes and judicial process to effectively manage your court and resolve court cases. Although some of you will rarely be seen or heard, 
your talent, your knowledge, your training will be evident in the management of your court, including the preparedness of your judge. So these cases that we're going to handle and manage, how long should it take to dispose of the case? The Criminal Code of Procedure, Article 32A, talks about the disposition of criminal cases and how long they should, or who should go first and how long they should take. The others that are family cases, the guidelines for those cases can be found in the Texas Rules of Judicial Administration. This is one of the first steps in managing court cases. And that is learning time standards or guidelines for disposing of a case. The last slide in this presentation will provide additional resources where you can learn more about model time standards. Part two of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure also sets out the rules of practice in district and county courts. This slide talks about how long juvenile cases, for those of you that have a court that preside over juvenile uh, cases, the requirements can be found in the Title III of the Texas Family Code. All right, so who should go first? Again, the Code of Criminal, Criminal Procedure, Chapter 32A, talks about prior, trial priorities. And it says that a criminal case shall go before a civil case. And it says that a criminal case, when a defendant is detained in jail, must go before a criminal case where the defendant is not in jail or in custody. But it says, the trial of a criminal action in which the victim is younger than 14 shall be given preference. And it also says the trial of a criminal action against a defendant who has been determined to be restored to competency under the Article 468.084 shall be given preference over other matters, whether they're civil or criminal. So learn this pecking order because this is invaluable when you have that attorney that claims that he or she cannot be put to trial in your court on a criminal case because of a divorce case in another court or county. Lead them to this chapter and let them know that you know that they are to try their criminal case first. Court calendars. So, Think of your court sessions as a party. You're giving a party. So your court calendars are dates that you're inviting people to your party. So we need to know when this party is going to be held. And the calendars can follow a schedule, such as family cases every first and third Tuesday, or criminal arraignments every first Wednesday of every other month, depending on how often your grand jury meets. Where's your party? Well, if your court shares a courtroom, consider the calendars of other courts. Consider the size of the docket and the size of the courtroom. Overcrowding can result in avoidable delay and can present a security risk. Who needs to know about your party? That would be attorneys, clerks, sheriff's office, probation office, anybody that participates in a court session they need to know. And why do attorneys need to know? Because if they practice in other courts, they will be more respectful of your court's time when they know there's a definite time and date when their case will be heard, especially when they're scheduling in other courts. They can refer to your calendar and either commit or ask the other court to give them another date because they have a priority setting with you. The more consistent your court calendar is, the more those working in your court will be in attendance and be prepared. If you constantly reschedule a court date or spontaneously set a group of cases, attorneys and other professionals 
will view your court as inconsistent and administratively unpredictable. You just don't know when they're going to have court. Once you establish a calendar for your court for either a six month or 12 month period, share it, share it with others. Doing so creates a uniformity among those working in your court and reduces confusion. Let others work for you. For example, by publishing your court calendars, when a defendant is arrested, the sheriff can look at your calendar and tell the defendant bonding out when his or her case will be set for arraignment if they're indicted. That will probably assure that the defendant will be in court. The bonding agent then knows by looking at your calendar when to tell the defendant the next court date is. The probation can tell a defendant when his or her motion to revoke will be set by just looking at your calendar. And that attorney, they can predict when a case will be set and can commit to representing a client. Let's talk about court dockets. What is a court docket? It is merely a list of cases which will be addressed by the court on a date, at a time, and for a specific purpose. The reason the case is set should be a meaningful purpose to move the case forward to a resolution. Avoid status settings. Let the parties and the attorneys know why they're there. Court dockets should be established by the court, not attorneys. And include the estimated time required for each case. A word about allowing attorneys to establish and or add to your court docket. A court who does this is known as having an attorney driven docket. Doing this may result in creating a backlog, which means you have more cases filed than what is disposed during a year. By allowing the attorneys to manage your docket, you're making it their party, not yours. Attorneys are often not good case managers. They have all these cases. When a court earns the reputation for setting cases for what is termed a trial date certain, attorneys learn to come prepared to court and they learn to expect the court will monitor the progress of their case. Waiting until the attorney to set a case when he or she is ready can be very exhausting for you and can result in backlog. Okay, so court dockets. Let's create a court docket in that date, in that calendar date that you established. Let's call this docket the family docket. The cases on this docket all have family related issues. The cases include divorce cases, temporary orders, or post-judgment matters. Regardless of the issue, all of the cases are sensitive in nature with confidential information being exchanged. To set a criminal case at the same time would be insensitive and inappropriate. Confidential information could be compromised and within earshot of a defendant. When your judge takes the bench, make sure he or she knows why every case is set and how much time he or she can expect to be on the bench. A judge that is not prepared for a six hour day can upset your court docket needlessly. Let's jump back to criminal cases. This is a typical misdemeanor case flow flow chart. You'll notice it has three tiers of processes going across from left to right. The first tier is the arrest or detention phase. The second tier is the court, pretrial and trial phase. And the last tier is the post trial phase. All of the events are typically what happens in a misdemeanor case flow. This slide and the following slide are available on the OCA website. Throughout this presentation, I have displayed a document or referenced a legal citation 
but may not have provided you with the direct link. The reason for this is that I want you to learn and master accessing and navigating the OCA website and searching for a legal statute on the legislative website. Both of these resources were presented on slide number three. If you have two screens on your desk, or even if you just have one, and you want to minimize this presentation, you should still be able to hear my voice. And if you want to go to our website, we can walk through to access this case flow. I will go slow and give you uh, time to bring up your Internet Explorer or Chrome icon, go to a free page, go to our website. Our address is www.txcourts.gov right slash OCA. Across the ribbon on the top of the page between the Texas flag and the body of the website, you will see a list of topics. This is the ribbon. Scroll over to the publications and training topic. You will see a drop down menu. Choose training from that drop down menu. On that page, you will see a list of training materials to the left of the screen. One of these is the criminal case flow, criminal case flow charts. Click on misdemeanor or felony. When you access this flowchart on the OCA website, it is an interactive flowchart, which means that you can pan or scroll within the flowchart. And when you get to a specific event, like warrant on the arrest and detention phase, you can click on that event and it will direct you straight to the statute that governs it. Aurora, just a minute. Can you please repeat the URL that you had said? Okay. It is www.tx, C as in cats, O U R T S dot G O V, right slash O C A. If you were able to access this flow chart, congratulations and let us know that you, that you did that. Uh, we'd like to know if, if you're pleased with that. We are, and we're very proud of it. Um, so the next slide has the felony flow chart. And Aurora, if I could just chime in, I do just want to let our attendees know that um, I will be sending out the PowerPoint slides to you all, so you will have a paper copy of it. Of it. Okay, so when um, you receive that uh, PowerPoint, um, you will probably be able to access them straight from the PowerPoint. So this this slide, uh, again, is the felony case flow. And again, it has three tiers, the arrest and detention. When the case gets to you, the court, pretrial and trial phase. And when the post-trial gets to you. So let's bring it all together, bringing it home. You have your court calendar. You've looked up your local rules. You've gone to the statute and you have seen what the guidelines, guidelines say. You've learned about trial priorities, who goes first. And now you're ready to have court. You've established your court calendar. You've consulted with those statutes and the requirements of service and notice and everybody should be ready. Let's, let's, Let's take one case and see if we can follow through. The rules of civil procedure 21B require that a three day notice be provided when serving a party with a notice of a hearing. This is on a civil case. When you send out notices, give them more than three days, give them at least 30 to 45 days for the hearing. If the hearing is being requested by an attorney, You've created a calendar that has a civil docket on February 1, and an attorney calls you and says, I have a civil matter. 
I'm within my three day notice. I'd like to set it for Friday, Friday, February the 1st. Identify the type of hearing that is being requested. Identify how much time they need from your judge. Ask that they send you the motion that they want to hear with a notice of hearing with that date that you have given them, February the 1st, nine o'clock or one o'clock. That is adding to your party attendance. So we thought everybody was ready for court, correct? There is always somebody that just was not ready. Criminal cases, the Code of Criminal Procedure, Article 2901, addresses those cases that should be continued by operation of law. That just means you can't go anywhere. That's what the law says. You can't try a criminal case until the defendant has been arrested. So clearly, if the defendant has not been arrested, uh, you have to continue the case. If the defendant has not been served, if there is not sufficient time for trial. So remember again, how much time do you need? If someone needs three days for a trial and your judge only has one day, then that case is gonna be continued. So make it a habit to ask, even on criminal cases, if you're put to trial, how many witnesses do you anticipate? How much time do you need? On civil cases, Continuances are addressed in the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, Rule 251. And that just says it needs to be filed. It needs to be heard. It can be granted except for sufficient cause, consent of the parties, or again, by operation of law. A word about continuances. Learn the procedure your judge wants to follow, whether it's all continuances must be set for hearing, or any agreed continuance is automatic. Learn what your judge is going to follow, what procedure is he or she going to follow, because nothing strips you of your credibility as not knowing what your judge wants or will approve or disapprove. This is the resource page that I was talking to you about, your continuing education. There are many more other uh, education venues that you can, providers that you can attend. These are the ones um, that address court management. Their websites are, um, and their conference schedules are posted on their website. The next page is the resources that will, you can go to, to learn more about um, the Judicial Council, the National Center for State Courts. It's a wonderful website. It lets you know what other states are doing. The model time standards is the one that uh, I was telling you about where you can study more on how long it should take for you to dispose of a case. And now we will open it up for questions. Thank you, Aurora, I appreciate your presentation. We do have a question from one of the attendees. They're asking, can they um, get advice on their, uh, I guess, structure of their court management? Is somebody able to help them assistant and just review it for them? Or who can they reach out to? Um, on the last page, which is the next page, you have uh, the contact information for the court services manager, Jeffrey Sunakawa. Um, you may email him and um, he will direct a staff member to help you. But yes, we are here to offer assistance in training and um, we can talk to you by phone. So yes, we are more than available for you. Great, thank you, Aurora. We do have another question, Aurora. Um, it says, where do I go next after getting to the OCA page. Can you, I guess, go, well, let's go back and repeat. So let me go back on the slides as well. Um, what are you trying to access? Are you trying to access uh, everything and anything on court management? If you're on our homepage, the OCA webpage, you should see Office of Court Administration. Again, across the ribbon, 
the top, um, you will have different uh, topics that you can that you can access. So it, it depends on what you're wanting to know. Do you want some information for your judge? We have judicial data um, for everything that is about court management. Go to programs and services and drop down to court consultant and click on the court consultant page that will take you to a description of your duties, education, um, a, a lot of sources on that. Great. So, and it looks like somebody also had a question in regards to the drop down on publication training, but I think you addressed that right. they go through program services and then court consulting. If that hasn't answered your question, please call Jeffrey or you may call me. Um, my phone number, write it down. I didn't include it in the in the slide. My phone number is 512-463-0986. Oh, well, it looks like we have one more question um, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, it says, will, will there be other webinars uh, of interest to court coordinators or court managers? We uh, recently did a three-part series on court management for child support courts. If your court handles child support enforcement um, and you are a court coordinator that also doubles as a coordinator for the child support, they are on our website. We have some um, websites coming up in April that will address uh, civil justice um, and how to manage your civil cases, and one on juvenile justice and how to manage juvenile cases. And I think we have some on court security coming up. We have one in March, I believe, on reporting to OCA. So you can check our website uh, continuously to see what is new and upcoming. Um, we just started the websites in October, November, um, and our goal is to do one every month. Uh, look for them to be on a Thursday at two o'clock. Uh, wish Thursday is uh, somewhat hard to predict because our schedules sometimes uh, change, but you can look for Thursdays at two. Hopefully that'll give you enough time to handle your court business and give us some time and if you can think of any topics that you think we need to be um, talking about, uh, let us know. There is also a webinar that we did in December on language access from our interpreters. So we're trying to reach all the areas that you that will benefit you. Um, but please, please reach out to us and let us know. And like Aurora said, we will we will have the upcoming webinars on our website and a link for you to register. So just keep an eye out for that. Uh, we have a few more questions, if you don't mind, Aurora. Do you have a couple more minutes? Sure. So, okay, great. Uh, one of our attendees is asking, is everything offered in upcoming webinars approved, or do we have to get approval in Harris County first before we take any class? I'm not sure if that's a question you can answer. Um, I, I'm not sure what you're talking about approved. Um, maybe Harris County has... Um, approval that you need to seek from your court uh, managers. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I can assure you that um, if you're in the county courts in Harris County, a lot of this uh, material was shared with your court manager, um, Mr. Ed Wells. So I can assure you that it meets with his approval. I don't know um, what approval you need to seek from uh, locally in Harris County. And if that doesn't answer, just also, like, like Boris said, just feel free to reach out to right. Jeffrey and we'll we'll find an answer for you. Uh, we have some questions that are still coming in, or if you don't mind, is the, are we still good to go? Sure. Great. We, we've got um, <laughs> a few more minutes. Yeah, we've okay. got a few more Perfect. minutes. Um, one of the attendees is asking, is there a cheat sheet somewhere on the OCA website that gives us timeline as to when to set hearings? Uh, um, if you have gone to PDP, uh, the Professional um, Development Program that is sponsored by the Texas Center, then there uh, you will get a sheet sheet and, and it talks about civil cases and I think it talks about 
criminal cases also. Um, there is one that I have developed when I train court coordinators on site, and I will be glad to share that with you right now. And it's, it's limited to criminal cases, but um, give me a call. And all of our emails are the same. It's first name, last name at txcourts.gov. So you can email me at Aurora. My last name is Samora at TX Courts, and I will send those to you. Great. Are there family? Are there flowcharts for family cases? Uh, and I don't remember, but I will. When you email me, I'll certainly look. Okay, great. Um, another question is: For the last two years, I've received an invitation to fill out an application for the P PDP training. Is the PDP training a mandatory training? To no, it, it is not mandatory, but it's awfully a good resource. Uh, the Texas Center sends those uh, applications to your judge. They won't go to you. Um, space is limited. I believe the deadline this year is February the 15th. Um, so get your application in. Um, they compensate you for the travel for a hotel. And I believe that your county um, pays for uh, whatever unreimbursed grant uh, expense. It's not mandatory. It is an excellent tool to start from. Great. And it looks like we received a suggestion from one of the attendees asking about doing a webinar on, that deals with tax cases. The, um, they say like that will um, help them with, um, sorry, let me, they will, you know, they just want to get some feedback onto that and they can share with other corners. But I think that, or that's a good topic that we can probably discuss. Tax cases, mm -hmm. okay. Well, we appreciate that. Great. So, well, Laura, that concludes our webinar. Um, before uh, the attendee, before you log off, I just want to say thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Aurora, for taking the time out of your day to come meet with us and do this webinar. Um, like I mentioned before, I will send out the PowerPoint as well as a link of the webinar recording to your email uh, in the next day or so, so you can have that handy. And also, if you don't mind, uh, when you log off, you will be um, linked to an evaluation. Could you please fill that out? It just provides some feedback on our webinars and how we can improve. And with that, I just want to say have a good afternoon and thanks once again. Thank you.